Hey, this is Stereo Police. Back with a video this time. I've finally gotten around to changing or attempting. I haven't started the job yet, but attempting to change out the power cord on the Yamaha A1000, uh, one of my favorite amplifiers. Um, there are a couple of annoyances I have with this amplifier. It sounds fantastic, but um, it's got a flimsy, thin power cord and uh, not very well protected. And I wanted to put something a little more substantial on there. So I purchased this uh, much larger gauge um, power cord. And I'm going to cut it down to, to a little longer than I need. I'm going to cut it down to the right length to meet the length of the uh, factory power cord that comes out of it. Um, but <clears throat> it is a larger wire and... Uh, the shield or the sheath around it um, I think provides a little more protection um, than what we have um, with the factory cord and uh, this the power cord that I purchased is a three prong so it has the earth ground which is that green wire there um, which is not used it's not needed but that's okay I'll just terminate it uh, internally it's no big deal uh, this design doesn't does not earth earth ground anything. The chassis would be one of the things that would normally be earth grounded. I was thinking about maybe going ahead and doing that, but I'm not sure. I haven't studied the schematic to see if that would cause any harm. Um, I'm just not sure at this point. But the amp sounds great and it's it's noise free as it is. So I think I'm just going to leave everything alone and not earth ground anything. Uh, I pulled the schematic or the portion of the schematic that I need um, um, to deal with the change out of the power cord and I'm going to cover a couple of interesting points here design wise that someone might find fascinating and I'll walk you through the process of changing the power cord I hope that I'm able to do it without messing anything up um, going to have to uh, figure out how to um, how to get this strain relief grommet off and uh, those are always a pain in the butt and if that hole is not large enough I'm gonna have to somehow enlarge the hole without getting metal filings all over the place and fortunately uh, if I do enlarge that hole I have this little grom this grommet kit here and I found uh, this grommet that fits perfectly perfectly let me see if I can do this with one hand yep perfectly over the new power cord um, but I'll probably have to, on the inside, put a couple zip ties on there to provide strain relief. So I've got all the parts I need. The question is, can I get this done? This is a tight space <clears throat> that I'm working with here. So what I've done so far, the only thing I've done is I re I've removed the top cover. And that's it right there. And I've removed the screws to this um, the transformer cover uh, it provides a safety aspect as well as some uh, shielding from electromagnetic radiation uh, iron core transformers are are uh, notably noisy uh, much noisier than toroidal transformers and uh, but I it occurred to me this working with some tight spaces down here so I'm gonna have to figure out how to remove the side panel over here and maybe even the uh, the lower panel Hell, I don't know what's going to be left of the chassis if I do that. I'm not sure how, what I'm going to do. Um, I just got to figure that out. I'll put the camera down in a minute and turn it off and figure that out. But um, the, the way the circuit works, uh, I'll put this on a tripod. Okay, so here's the portion of the schematic that begins with the, uh, the power receptacle, and it's a two prong. Um, one. One prong is uh, hot and the other prong is neutral. I'm going to the house mains. And I drew this varistor in here because this was a surprise. Um, when I opened up the top there, I found a varistor uh, connected directly between hot and neutral. And I'll explain to you what that is in a minute. It's not on the schematic, but it is a safety device. And I'm probably going to cut that out because I don't want it. Uh, and I'll explain to you why in, in just a minute. But, so basically, power comes in from the receptacle and it goes to 
you know, I should have, I should actually have this off the tripod because I'm going to move around. And this is typical of old, old receivers where you don't see it much anymore, where you have um, power receptacles on the back of the receiver, and that's what you have right here. You've got two of them that are switched, meaning uh, you can plug accessories into this, other components, and they will come on with the, uh, with the um, power button on the front of the amp. And you have an unswitched, which is, which is always live. Um, so, zoom out. So we have our hot and neutral. They come in. Neutral comes in and it connects to all of the receptacles right here. They're all shorted together. And hot goes to the first receptacle that's unswitched. So you can see how that's unswitched. It's always, it's always going to be live. Um, and then hot goes from the unswitched receptacle and it goes through the main power switch that's on the upper left hand corner of the amp in the front and uh, coupled between that is uh, <clears throat> is a capacitor I did, my, my writing's bad that's a suppression capacitor and that basically suppresses electromagnetic radiation that uh, that's either on existing on uh, it, I should say RF, but um, it's electromagnetic. It's 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 a RF suppression, radio frequency suppression. If there's any uh, RF on the power lines, it will basically short it out and uh, get rid of it. Um, and I suppose maybe it could also uh, help with switch noise as well, but I don't think that's the main purpose of it. I think it's a suppression capacitor. Uh, and I'll explain that in a minute. And then, so we go through the power switch, then we go through a fuse. And we come back down and we go through the primary on the power transformer. Uh, we go through a, what does that say, 169 degrees, 169. This is a thermal, I'll try to write a little slower, a thermal fuse. And uh, I'll explain that in just a minute if you don't know what it is. And then we go back to neutral. So that's how we complete our circuit. And the whole purpose of this circuit I just walked you through is, number one, to turn the power on. Number two, it provides protection in three forms. It's got a varistor, a fuse, uh, and a thermal fuse. And the third purpose is to activate or to turn on the primary windings of the main power transformer to get everything running, of course. Um, and this varistor, it does not show up on the schematic, but nevertheless, it is there. So I thought, as I'm going through this process, walking through it, I thought you'd maybe find it fascinating to, to know what these, these things are and what they do. They're pretty straightforward and fairly simple. Um, so let's, let's start out. I'll, I'll come back to some of this stuff later. I want to expose more of the, uh, of the, of the uh, wiring back here to see if I can get to the point where... I'm able to work in there and 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 uh, desolder uh, the power, the existing power cord is mainly what I have to do. And there's the varistor right there. That's that big. I believe it is. You know, I haven't looked. I, I haven't seen any of the markings on it and haven't looked at it. But it looks like a varistor, and it goes directly across um, hot and neutral. It, it appears. Maybe something will change when I get in there, but uh, that's what it appears to be, and it's not on the schematic. So, um, <coughs> following these wires up front, here is the switch. Okay, so this is the main power switch on off. And there's that suppression capacitor right there. It's facing backwards. You can't read the value, but it's a 0 .01, I believe. Yes, yeah, 0 .01 microfarad. Um, here is the main fuse right here. Uh, it is a 10 amp, 250 volt. And that's what it says right here, 10 amp, 250 volt. There's another fuse there, and it doesn't show any connections. Uh, and I'm not sure what that's for. And I really don't, frankly, don't care because I don't need to know uh, right now. But the 10 amp, 250 volt is the uh, power line fuse. Okay. And then when we come back, you know, basically the, the uh, wires come back around from the fuse and then go into the tra primary of the transformer and then loop back around from the transformer back back around to this rail down here which is neutral so that's the primary uh, 
primary side of the transformers circuit. And of course my goal is to change out the power cord, but I thought we'd talk about a couple of these things along the way. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put this down and try to expose this area a little more to look in there and see what's going on. Right now I just can't work. I did take the screws out of the uh, power receptacle as you can see, but it doesn't, it doesn't go anywhere. It won't come out because it's about as far as it goes. It's wires are tugging on it and I can't, I can't get behind it to do any soldering so I'm going to have to try something else. Um, well you know what, before I, and I might as well, before I start that project, I might as well finish talking about this. Um, so this varistor right here, it's a safety um, device and this is, uh, there are various uh, elect electrical devices that you find in surge protectors and one of the more common I hope I spelled it right, V-A-R-I-S-T-O-R. -R. One of the more common um, circ uh, pieces of circuitry in there is, is a varistor. Um, there are other things that can be used, um, uh, namely, uh, what are they called? Gas tubes, gas plasma, uh, gas discharge <coughs> tubes. And they're little tiny evacuated tubes with a gas in there. And, and uh, when there's a high enough voltage across both terminals the gas will become a conductor and it'll conduct and snub or short out the spike any spikes in voltage that appear on the power line that's what this does but instead of using a gas it's a semiconductor um, or at least the modern varistors are semiconductors um, and what will happen is if you know normally let me uh, turn this over let me draw power lines here So normally we got you know steady 120 120 volts AC RMS uh, sine wave coming in and everyone's happy and that's perfectly fine. But there are various kinds of surges that can happen. Uh, there's over voltage. There's spikes. There's lightning. Uh, any kind of surge that significantly increases this voltage will be without protection will be passed on to the uh, primary windings of the transformer. Um, now at a certain point, if there's too much current flowing through here, the fuse will blow, but a fuse is a relatively slow thing because uh, it, metal actually has to melt, and that takes time. You know, the time might be in you know, less than a second, a fraction of a second, but still, that's enough to do significant damage. Uh, and not only that, if the voltage uh, is too high across the fuse, it will arc across the fuse and uh, current will continue to flow. So uh, what's needed for surges or super high spikes such as lightning hitting the power line or there's other sources of these sorts of things is a device that acts as I'm going to draw the primary windings of the transformer there. should be a fuse in this circuit but I haven't drawn it we need a device that normally acts as an open switch <clears throat> with normal voltages and when you get a surge and I'll just draw this normal voltage and all of a sudden I'll draw this major surge in voltage like let's just say this is uh, three kilovolts or more it could be more than that um, we need a device that once a voltage reaches a certain point some kind of threshold acts as a closed switch and when that happens we've effectively shorted the surge out okay from hot to neutral or vice versa and hence if we short it out that voltage can never reach the primary windings and that's what a varistor does let me see if I remember how to draw okay I'm gonna call this current I'm going to call this voltage. And there's a certain voltage right here that's characteristic of the varistor that you choose. And let me just say the voltage is 200 volts or something like that. I'll just choose a number beyond which I want surge protection to kick in. And I'm not honestly sure what they use. I've never studied surge protector theory or schematics, so I'm not sure what they use in there. Uh, you don't want anywhere near 120, though, because often the power 
company will have a slight increase in voltage, and you don't want your uh, you don't want your um, receiver turning off. Uh, it should be able to handle a slight slight voltage surge. You want this thing to kick on with ultra high surges. So I'm going to say 200 volts. Could be more than that. Okay, so in this operating range right here, and this is 120, let's say, uh, in this range right here, nothing happens. We don't want anything to happen. We want this to be an open switch, and that's what the varistor does. This is the end. There's a small little current um, flowing through here at all times. Uh, it's the nature of the semiconductor, but it's extremely small, and it's no big deal. It doesn't affect anything. But as soon as you reach a certain voltage, all of a sudden, all of a sudden you can see the current will, can surge. Current can flow through this varistor right here, but while current's flowing through there, the voltage doesn't go up. Okay, the voltage doesn't increase. And that's what we want. We want this to maintain a certain voltage while it's allowing that current from the surge to flow through there and bypass uh, the primary windings. I hope I got that right. It's been a while. Uh, I don't work with varistors that often, but basically that's the principle of how a surge protector works. Now one thing about varistors um, is that there are possibly little surges happening all the time. Um, and that varistor might have kicked on numerous times in its life and normally it can, it can, you know, once the surge is gone, it can resume its normal operation. Occasionally, with a super high surge, that that varistor will just either short circuit or open, and it's fried either way. But normally, it can handle surges and then renew, resume its normal sort of open switch um, status. But it can only handle so many cycles of that, and then it begins to degrade. And it, it could begin to degrade in a number of ways. And uh, um, if it if it became an open circuit right here, that would be fine. Uh, because not, it would be like it wasn't even there, right? But it could also sort of become a closed circuit or somewhere in between and start sucking current uh, even while the uh, amp is operating. And that would be diverting or pulling current away from my transformer, and I don't want that. So that's why I'm going to cut the varistor out of the circuit. I'm going to cut that out. I don't want it if that's what it is. Darn sure looks like it, right? And the reason is, I plug my equipment into surge protectors anyway. Uh, I never plug my equipment directly into the wall. I always go through quality surge protectors, which have, you know, they're new, and they have brand new varistors in there, and, and um, everything is working as it should. So I really don't want that there. Because it's old, and I don't know how many times it's cycled, uh, or what it's doing. So it's really not needed as long as you're plugging your equipment into a surge protector. Um, <clears throat> now that's protection number one. Protection number two is of course the fuse. Uh, and that fuse is not really there to protect from surges per se, because the fuse is not a surge protector. What that's there for is if something in the amp shorts out. Uh, or partially shorts and the amp draw, starts to draw too much current then this fuse will blow and turn off the amp and hopefully prevent fires or further damage of whatever happened in here. So this fuse is there to protect the circuitry of the amp. Um, and then what we have down here is what's called a thermal fuse and it's hard to see but it says 169 degrees Celsius. Now that's that's pretty hot. And, you know, I couldn't find where that thing is, actually. I'm not even sure where it is. Um, if I open this up and I see it, I'll, I'll point it out to you. But um, it appears from the schematic, all this doesn't necessarily mean anything, but from the schematic, it appears like it's either internal to the transformer or attached to it somewhere. And we'll look for that. But basically, a thermal fuse is just what what it says it's a thermal fuse is well a regular fuse you know I'll just draw a regular fuse here is a piece of metal sometimes they look like that and it's a piece of metal and it's it's uh, which means it's a pure conductor and it's conducting current most of the time but 
um, what will happen is when you, you know it's got this little thin strand in here and when you uh, reach a certain point uh, of, of the current rating if it's rated at 5 amps for example um, then this piece of metal will start heating up um, to the point where it will melt away and a, and a piece of metal will evaporate and when that happens it'll create an open circuit right like that a lot of times on the on the on the glass of the fuse you'll see a little burnt mark and that's just because of the heat produced by the melting of uh, uh, by the uh, current flowing through that uh, metal and and then it melts and um, and you see that little black mark right well a thermal fuse is similar except it's not it doesn't blow based on the amount of current flowing through there it blows it although that's part of it it blows when uh, the temperature whether it's ambient around it or internal to it reaches a certain temperature and then it'll blow so this is sensing the temperature of its surroundings basically and you find these a lot on like you know, light fixtures um, ceiling fans things like that where uh, there's lights on there and if you know if things get too hot it, it wants to shut everything down you find a thermal fuse on there so that's a thermal fuse and that's somehow protecting this transformer um, so we'll try to find that in there now um, and of course this is just the protection circuitry that's uh, surrounding the primary of the transformer of course there's other protection circuitry built into amplifiers uh, such as uh, a lot of times you'll find thermal uh, thermal readings taking off of heat sinks and uh, which is kind of what you have right this is actually not a protection these uh, these little these are transistors and they are attached to the heat sinks and they adjust the bias of the, of the uh, output circuitry based on heat being generated so it's kind of a regulation but there's other protection circuitry short circuit protection for the speakers that kick on relays or kick off relays and that sort of thing so we're not going to talk about that but uh, that's not related to what I'm doing but anyway there's the primary circuit we'll put this down I'm going to try to uh, remove a few more panels and see if I can gain more access because I right now I darn sure can't do any soldering in there okay so I just needed to remove the side panel and I did go ahead and remove the bottom uh, the bottom panel but I really don't think I needed to do that but I wanted to uh, get in there and look around anyway to make sure there are no I kept hearing a loose flake of something moving around in there when I lifted the amp so I wanted to try to find that uh, I haven't found that yet um, so I'll give it a good shake but uh, anyway so here is the uh, the power receptacle and and I've exposed what I need and that would be this black wire right here is the power cord and coming out of it are two wires the black and the white and the white wire gotta hold this the white wire right here is hot and the black wire is going to the neutral panel uh, the neutral bus bar right there and here is I don't know, that's kind of the opposite of what, yeah, that's that's right. I mean, normally, uh, you know, when you're doing household wiring, neutral is, did I get that right? Yeah, neutral is the uh, hot one. I mean, I'm sorry, white is, white is neutral, but I can trace these wires. Let me see, let me see what's going on here. Is that See, this is not polarized. That's the thing, you know. Not modern uh, receptacles are polarized with a a larger slot and a smaller sh slot, um, and the smaller one is for, I believe, that's the hot one, and the larger one is for neutral. So it's not polarized here, but we can tell. We can tell that the white one is, you know, yeah, it doesn't matter because I'm just thinking out loud here. Let me look at the plug itself. Yeah, you see? So both prongs are the same size. They're both uh, the smaller size. So you could put this in the outlet either way. 
Um, so that's this is this isn't obviously an old enough amp to where the, it was built before the the new standard where where the um, hot wire. Uh, I'm always getting on a tangent here. So when we draw, well, I can't draw. There's a large draw a perspective view. So on a plug, there's a larger prong and a smaller one, and the smaller one is connected to the hot wire. So when you when you look at the wires on the cord itself, you got black. This is normally how a house is wired, and white. And uh, black is hot, and white is neutral. So normally when you'd go into a power supply, you would switch the hot wire, and you would also fuse the hot wire, right? So that when, uh, and, and because neutral back at the circuit panel is also tied in with the earth ground. So that's for safety. So anytime you're touching the white wire, even though current is flowing through it to complete the circuit, the voltage level of that is at ground potential, at least it is back at the, uh, at the back, back at the circuit panel, the circuit breaker box. So that's normally how you do it, but uh, and to make that uh, to make that a reality, you have to have a polarized plug where it can only fit into an outlet one way, and that's why the larger and the smaller. But back back when these amps were built and before that, they we didn't have that that standard, and so um, it's a crapshoot depending on which way you plug it in. However, I am going to ensure, and this is one benefit of putting this this new power cord on. You can see that we've got this is going to be a polarized plug. It's hard to tell, but that's the larger of the oh, that's the larger of the two prongs where my thumb is, and that's the smaller. And that can only fit into the outlet. You can see you got a larger one in a. Um, can't get this camera. You got a larger one in the smaller one, and uh, as I said, the uh, smaller one is hot, and that's neutral. So I'm going to ensure. And this is an added benefit of changing, an added benefit of changing out the power uh, cord here. I am going to ensure that the hot wire, the smaller of the two prongs, is connected to the switch. And that way, anytime the switch is off, uh, the, the hot wire, which is the most dangerous wire, is not connected to any part of the transformer. Um, and uh, and if the circuit blows, of course, the fuse is in line with the hot, so it's the hot side that blows. And so what if the neutral side is still connected up um, to, to the bus bar right here because it's it's earth grounded and you can't get a shock by touching it. Um, so that is an added benefit that I really didn't even think about when I decided to undertake this project of changing the power cord, but we're going to make that a reality. Um, so I have access, and I think I've got enough. I've got enough space on that little tab there to solder the new wire. So I don't think I'm going to desolder the old ones. I'm just going to cut them real close. And here is what I believe to be the varistor. I still can't read it. It's got a plastic sleeve over it. That's kind of hazy. But I'm going to go ahead and cut that off and remove that sleeve and see what the heck that thing is. It can only be a varistor. Okay, I'll hit pause and carry on and pick up uh, in just a little bit. Okay, well that didn't that didn't go too bad. Uh, I was in the middle of it, so I <clears throat> thought I'd finish the job. Here's the power cord, and this is uh, one of those little strain relief snap-in doohickeys, and rather than oops, rather than 
try to get it out in one piece because I'm not going to reuse it. I just went ahead and cut it with these monsters right from the back. And uh, that's what's left of it. And this power cord is essentially useless. I wouldn't use it in anything because it's not polarized, so it's going to say goodbye. And there's the hole. I'm really hoping, I haven't tried this yet, is it going to be big enough? Of course it is, look at that. I don't have to do any grinding. <clears throat> now, if I get really lucky, which I'm seldom this lucky, that grommet, mm, I'm going to try to squeeze that grommet in there. That's going to be, ooh, that's going to be tough. But if I squeeze that in there, it might make the inner diameter too small for the for the new power cord. I don't know. But that's the next step. Well, actually, the next step is I got to size this cord right. Right now, it's, this is an eight-foot cord, and the one that came off of it, I shouldn't have thrown it away. I don't know how holding it up, and it is it's about six feet. So I'm going to cut that down to about six feet and uh, restrip it and get those wires the right length to fit back up in there and figure out how to solder that thing. So, so far so good. It's going pretty smoothly. I haven't found that little part that's rattling around in here, but when I get done I'll kind of shake it. There's the bottom side. I Never showed, I never took off the bottom panel when I did the review of the A1000, but there it is. Circuit board. Some pretty crappy, I'd say some pretty crappy soldering there. Well, maybe not crappy, but not as professional as you I would have thought. But, it's a darn good amp though. Okay, so next step is to cut this cut this power cord down, and uh, yeah, I think I'll start get, trying to get that grommet in there, and then see if it fits, and then cut cut it down. Okay, okay. Well, I I managed to squeeze the grommet in there with my hands. Didn't need any tools, and I don't often get this lucky, but it squeezed right in there, and the power cord fits like a glove I mean boom perfect fits like a glove so I don't often get that lucky I'm gonna have to do some sort of strain relief back here like I mentioned because previously it had that little doohickey that did the strain relief and and um, right now if if I put this cord in there and solder it up and someone yanks on it uh, the only strain relief is the solder itself and that's solder is never meant to be a structural Thing. it's only meant to be an electrical connection so I think what I'll do I'll think about that but I think I'm going to use zip ties why not huh zip ties aren't offensive to an amplifier all right okay now I got to do a bunch of cutting and finagling here it's probably got a good half hour's work ahead of me before I pick up again here but uh, another annoyance I have with this amp is these Binding posts are just terrible. I'd love to do something about that at some point, but that's just look at that, they're all on a circuit board, so that wouldn't be easy. That would be messy as hell. Um, and the reason why I don't like these binding posts is when look how close, look how close you are when you put up whether it's a end of a speaker cable or whether it's a uh, see it, it, these don't fit bananas I wouldn't use them anyway but whether it's uh, how uh, what are those little I can't remember those little hook things you put in there what the hell are they called I can't I'm, that's not coming to my mind um, they're so close to touching the chassis and if you know if one and this is not chassis grounded I don't believe but if the positive touch the chassis and the negative touch the chassis you'd be shorting out the amp 
Now Yamaha puts a bunch of plastic around this area on their new amps, but I guess to prevent that possibility, but not on this one. And I did have the protection circuit kick in one time. Um, the uh, speaker protection relays kicked in, so I'm assuming that I did get a short back here at one point. Um, but love to do something about that, and I'm not sure what. It's kind of dangerous. Um, but all other aspects of this amp I love. That's why I'm putting the time into it, doing what I'm doing. But well, I'd love to, I'd love to correct that that issue. And they are kind of cheap, plasticky things that wobble around. They don't really instill confidence. I wish that was one thing that was better. But um, okay, all right, back to back to the power cord. Oh yeah, uh, one thing I forgot to mention. See, this is I learn this stuff as I go, or figure this out as I go. But it turns out I cut that what I thought was a varistor off there and uh, removed the uh, the cover to it. This gooey stuff that's kind of degrading. And what I found was a standard a ceramic, I believe, ceramic capacitor, and it's a 10 nanofarad capacitor. 10 nanofarads. Uh, that's what the markings showed. And uh, let me go ahead and see if I can get a measurement off my DVM. Uh, so there was an extra capacitor in the circuit. Okay. 13 nanofarads. The markings on the capacitor were uh, 103p, which is 10 to the third power of picofarads, which puts it at 10 nanofarads, which is roughly what we measured. So there was, was not a varistor. So, dummy ended up cutting off a capacitor. So between there and there was a ten nanofarad capacitor. Now I confirmed that this little this capacitor up here is indeed this 0.01 microfarad right there. Um, and we had another capacitor across them uh, between a hot and neutral. That was a 10 nanofarad and it was not on the schematic and I don't know why that's there or that whether it'll make a difference. They're certainly available if I want to put one back. These leads these leads are long enough I could probably resolder it so I'm going to hold on to that but I don't don't think I want it there. They, they put this plastic cover on it as if they were maybe a bit worried about the thing uh, shorting out and heating up or blowing up. Um, and I'd love to know why it was there. We already have this suppression capacitor. Uh, this RF suppression capacitor there which would perform a similar function. Um, you know perhaps this is there for switch noise but I really don't know. I mean the only purpose basically what we had is uh, and I'll draw ooh, let me redraw that. Well, essentially what we had is a capacitor and this is this this you know you see this on schematics we had a capacitor directly across the power uh, between the, the hot and the neutral. Um, and the only purpose this is, uh, this would have, is for noise suppression. But again, that .01 is also doing the same thing. Um, and the only difference I see between these two capacitors, and I'm just sort of thinking out loud here, is that this capacitor being across the switch, any noise well, no, any noise that it would any noise that it would suppress would end up going through the transformer and then back to the switch, but it's still across the it's still between the hot and the neutral though, it just has to go through the transformer. And yeah, whereas this is directly across the main the mains uh it's definitely there for noise. What did I say ten 
nanofarad. Um, so I don't know. I think I'm going to leave it off. I th these capacitors, these are not. There are more modern devices, suppression capacitors that are built to be directly across the power lines, and this is not one of them. There are capacitors that are designed specifically for that purpose, and they're called suppression capacitors. And they're designed to sit there and go between uh, the 120 volt line, uh, the hot and the neutral, and they're, and they're designed for that, and they're also designed to fail in certain ways. Um, there are uh, there are suppression capacitors that are designed to fail as a short and, and capacitors that are designed to fail as an open. Um, and they're made for that purpose. Um, uh, but rather than get into that, I can tell you that this is not one of them. This is a st standard ceramic disc capacitor. And I still find it to be, because it's not designed for that purpose, I'm going to leave it out of the circuit. And if I find that for some reason I need one, I'm going to buy the right component for it. I'm going to buy an actual suppression capacitor put in there. So I'm going to leave it out of there. And by the way, um, it's the last thing I'll say, I'll wrap up part one. I think I'll need a calculator for this one. Let's briefly talk about, because I always end up talking about stuff other than the project that I'm working on. Let's talk about what these suppression capacitors do and how they do it real quick. Um, a capacitor, well let's talk about two things. Look at it both. A capacitor is basically a, a resistor when it, when it sees AC alternating current and its resistance changes based on frequency and we call that uh, resistance capacitive reactance we give it an X and it equals 1 over 2 times pi times the frequency of the current going through it times the capacitance in microfarads so let's do two things. Let's find out what the resistance or capacitive reactance is at 60 hertz. And then let's find out what it is at 1 megahertz. And I'm going to call that like RF noise, you know, uh, just some noise on the line that we want to get rid of. I'm just picking the 60 hertz because that's what's normally across the thing, okay? Normally we have this and this suppression capacitor right here. And this could be it's the same thing whether we're talking about the one that was right here or this one up here. They're both directly between or they're both directly between the hot and the neutral. And let's find out what the resistances are for both and, and this will sort of give you an idea how the thing functions. So let me run these numbers for 60 hertz. So basically I'm just going to do the reciprocal of 1 over 2 pi 60 times. And let's use this capacitor right here, 0.01 microfarads. And rather than bore you with the calculations, I'll hit pause and do it right here. Okay, sorry, I'm running, I'm sort of running out of paper space right here. But so anyway. Um, we have our 120 volt power coming in, and there's this suppression capacitor directly between hot and neutral. And at 120 volts, this is at 60 hertz, this is our power. You know, different for Europe and 50 and overseas, but roughly the same. So at 120 volts, 60 hertz, RMS this capacitor looks like a resistor to the AC that uh, is equivalent to 265 K ohms 265 kilo ohms that's pretty high and I ran the numbers for the current that would be flowing through there 
uh, through this capacitor at that resistance or that capacitive reactance and it's 0.5 milliamps. So there's very little, at 120 volts, there's very little leakage current going through that capacitor. Not enough to affect the power supply. However, at higher frequencies, and I chose one megahertz, but uh, in that ballpark, in that stadium, uh, that same capacitive reactance is going to be 16 ohms. Again, it's 1 over 2 pi frequency times capacitance. It will be 16 ohms, very low. So any uh, uh, radio frequency, RF, or other types of interference that are at super high frequencies are going to see a very low resistor, and it's going to pass that through back to neutral. It's going to pass the current associated with that noise to neutral, thus bypassing the, uh, the input to the, um, the, main, uh, the primary side of the transformer. And as the frequency goes up, that 16 ohms will go down and vice versa. So these suppression capacitors suppress or bypass high frequency noise from getting to the, uh, the, the power supply, basically. Now, that point, I should have run the numbers for that nanofarad. Um, wow. Let me, let me uh, put this down and run the numbers for that... Uh, uh, for that 10 nanofarad, because that's going to be doing pretty much the same thing, but let's find out what the resistance is at the 1 megahertz for that uh, nanofarad. And you know, um, I'm just not thinking right now, apparently, because it just didn't even occur to me, because we're working in picos, I'm um, sorry, we're working in micros and nanos, and, duh, this is a 0.01 microfarad. And you can draw that out decimal as because uh, the unit uh, of capacitor is farads, but uh, we usually work in much smaller numbers in micros and nanos and picos, so it's 0 0.000001 000 farads, right? That's our 0.01. Well, this is a 0.01 microfarad but it's also a 10 nanofarad because nano is the next is 10 to the negative micro is 10 to the negative 6 and nano is 10 to the negative 9 so a 10 nanofarad is the same thing as a 0.01 microfarad duh so it's really the same capacitor which is going to have the same uh, and again I'm just thinking out loud as I go here I don't, I don't cut and edit these things to make me sound smart because a lot of times I'm pretty stupid when I'm doing these things but um, so it's the same value capacitor um, this is the same value capacitor as that so which begs the question and the fact that that this capacitor right here is put directly across um, directly across the, between the hot and neutral and this one here is across the switch and this one was not on the schematic. It was an, it was some kind of update to the circuit. Um, they found some issue with this not functioning or not doing the job they wanted. And I don't know. I really don't know why they put that here. Um, perhaps they intended this as a shorting device uh, of some kind uh, for uh, surges. I, I, I really don't know. Um, but nevertheless, we still have this guy here. Um, and... You know, again, the only difference is directly across the power lines where this is across the switch, meaning any current flowing through this has to pass through the transformer uh, uh, first, but it's still going to be shorting out the RF. Uh, I don't know. I'm just going to leave it at that. I'm not going to let it bother me, even though it probably will. And I'm not going to put it back for the time being. Um, I just really don't think it's necessary. Um, and it, to me, it's also a safety hazard. In fact, in some sense, that's a bit of a safety hazard. Not extraordinarily, because that's not designed to sit there and go and, 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 you know, even when that switch is off, this, this capacitor is experiencing constantly 120 volts across it. Even when that switch is off, and that these older style ceramic capacitors weren't really designed to do that. Like I told you, there are modern suppression capacitors that can handle that and that are designed for it. So honestly, that should be replaced with a suppression cap as well. 
uh, but I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to leave it alone. I'm going to leave that cap out of the circuit and move forward from here. So there you go. I just thought I'd give you a little sample of my uh, incompetence um, of not being able to distinguish between a 10 nanofarad and a 0.01 microfarad. Uh, um, anyway, I'm going to call this the end of this part, and I'm going to go ahead and cut that power line and get it soldered in here, and that's it's a Sunday night right now, and it's 7 o'clock, and I've, I've had it. I think I'll go ahead and wrap this up. But I am looking forward to getting that new power cord in there. I'm so thankful that uh, this grommet that I had, it's a little loose, but it fit in there. And it'll protect the sheath of that. And uh, and then this diameter fits perfectly into that grommet. So that these sort of serendipity things don't happen to me that often. So I'm, I'm pretty thankful. I don't have to make that I didn't have to drill into this, make any modifications. Worked out perfectly. And you know, I'm thankful also that uh, that um, from a real safety perspective, I'm thankful that I'm going to be able to get this properly polarized uh, so that when you plug it in with this polarized plug here, that will always have hot that's being switched. So that's that's a that's a major benefit besides the fact this is a larger gauge power cord and that the power cord is much better much better protected um, and uh, over that thin thing that came off it so uh, this this is this is a significant upgrade to this amp so I think uh, um, I think it's well worth well worth the, the trouble uh, of doing this I think if anyone, and by, oh, by the way, one thing I forgot to mention uh, a long time ago when I was reviewing this amp, I believe I opened it up and said that it didn't look like anything had been tampered with or toyed with in here, meaning it was all original, but that's not true. Looking around a little bit, I noticed, I guess I didn't look that closely, but there are some new electrolytic capacitors. I don't believe these are original. I don't believe that those are original either. Um, so I think someone has actually put some money into this amplifier before I purchased it and had these capacitors upgraded or these electrolytics replaced which is important over the years because electrolytics will change their characteristics and they will leak and I don't know if these are new or not I mean they say Yamaha on there and to me if they were replaced it, they'd be hard pressed to get these perfectly fitting Yamaha capacitors to go in these little um, these covers right here but they may have been replaced because nothing is leaking everything is perfectly there's no leakage of anything down there and I know the amp doesn't hum or buzz um, those appear to be new new capacitors those are definitely newer so that's another benefit is someone actually took this to well you know what let me go down and see if I can see. Let me lift this up and see if I can see if, they get, if there's any evidence of soldering. I'm gonna get a flashlight. Probably should have hit pause. Uh, yep. So there is a little evidence down here. See that right there? Somebody has done some soldering in here. And right there. And that's in the vicinity of those capacitors. So someone has been in here. And there's where the uh, original, uh, the large electrolytics are for the power supply. and. I don't No, these are original so those nothing's leaking and you can see those uh, there's wire wrapping right there as well as soldering there's no way a technician could have desoldered those and put them back in that shape so those are original electrolytics but down here some have been replaced so someone's had this in for service and it looks like they did a pretty good job. Uh, they had a, uh, someone had a professional work on it, so that's I'm thankful for that as well. Um, okay. Anyway, that's enough for tonight. I think I'll wrap it up.
um, and uh, pick up on part two and uh, of the power supply. <laughs> yeah, yeah, power supply. Part two of the power cord replacement. But I hope that uh, all this was helpful to somebody and uh, they enjoyed it. And um, I'll just lose some sleep over that capacitor tonight. And uh, but I'm gonna hook it back up and turn it on and listen and make sure there's no noise and I don't I just can't imagine that that thing does anything but I just would love to know why Yamaha substituted that thing in there it's not on the schematic and what their thought was and what the reasoning was behind it um, anyway thanks for watching and I'll pick up uh, in the near future or I'll, my next video will be finishing up this job and we'll plug it in and listen to it and and um, I'll film the first turn on so if it blows up you'll be uh you'll you'll get to see it. Seriously. I'll do that. <laughs> that nervous first turn on after a repair. Okay, ciao.